Okay, let's wrap up a few loose ends, um, things that apply to both chi-squared goodness of fit test and chi-squared test of independence. So both of these tests have the same conditions. Um, as usual, we need to have some kind of randomness. Um, so there's different options depending on what kind of conclusions you're hoping to draw. So random selection, if you have random selection, um, or at the very least a representative sample, that allows you to generalize to the population. So the example that we had with um, MSIT students and their housing, um, that would be something where we want to generalize to the population of all MSIT 3000 students, so we need to have at least a representative sample. Random selection would be the best way to get it, um, but at least a representative sample. The other option is random assignment. So the one where we were um, looking at the different choices of, or sorry, the different size choice sets, um, that would be more like random assignment, right? It's more or less random whether people see the small or the large choice set. Um, and that's where we're hoping to make cause and effect conclusions. So random assignment supports cause and effect conclusions um, because it balances out any potential confounders. Um, and so you end up with two groups that are actually comparable. Okay, another um, condition that's familiar is the sample size. So our, the way of checking it looks a little bit different, but it's the same idea as before. So the way we check the sample size now um, is we, by using the expected counts. So the rule here is that the expected counts are all at least five. And I think this is actually given on the reference sheet too, that your expected counts need to be at least five um, before you use a chi-square test. So the last thing we'll talk about is using residuals as a follow-up analysis. So first of all, why is this follow-up necessary? We've never done this um, for any other types of tests. So let's talk about it for each of them. So I'm abbreviating chi-square goodness of fit. If you look at the alternative hypothesis for a chi-square goodness of fit test, you're just saying at least one of your proportions is different from the others. So a lot of times that's not really satisfying. At least one is different. Well, which one, right? If you're gonna do anything useful, um, you need to know which one is different. Um, also a chi-squared test of independence. So when we do our alternative hypothesis for a chi-squared test of independence, the alternative just says there is an association. Right, so we know that the two variables are related to each other, but the alternative doesn't tell us how they're related, right? Related how? Is it positive? Is it negative? We don't know just from the alternative. Um, so we want to do some kind of follow-up to understand this relationship better, okay? So residuals show which individual categories have large differences between observed and expected. Right? Because if we conclude the alternative, we're saying that the observed and the expected are different enough to convince us, um, but this is saying exactly where those differences come from. Okay, So we're going to use this formula for the residual, and actually this is a standardized residual because it's not just looking at the difference in observed and expected, um, but it's standardizing it based on the expected count, so sort of a way of taking sample size into account. So a positive residual means that the observed count is larger than the expected count, larger than what you would have expected if the null hypothesis is true. A negative residual means that the observed count is smaller than expected. And because this is standardized, we sort of have an idea of how big we expect these residuals to be. Um, we would say values less than negative 2 or greater than 2 those seem pretty unusual, right? Those are going to kind of stand out to us. So let's go back to this um, housing example. Um, so I've got my null hypothesis here, um, and I'm going to fill in the observed counts that we got, 56, 15, and 7. So that was 78 in our sample total. Um, to calculate the expected counts in each of those categories, I would take 78 times the number from the null hypothesis, the proportion from the null hypothesis. So like this one is 
And if I do that for the other categories too, 4.29 and 22.23, I've got all my expected counts. Um, so if you're thinking about the conditions, you may notice that the conditions are not technically met here. Um, one of them is a little bit too small because our smallest expected count is less than five, right? So it's not about how many you actually had. Our observed counts are all big enough, but our smallest expected count, 4.29, is actually a little bit less than five, um, so it's not technically met here. Um, I'm not super worried because the p-value, if you remember, was incredibly small. So even if it's a little bit off, it's not going to change our conclusion. Um, but we would want to be careful here. And I remember being very annoyed because there were definitely more than 78 people in the room that day. But whatever, we'll, we'll let that class uh, off the hook now. And while we're checking conditions, let's go ahead and comment on the random sample. Right? This was not a random sample. Um, this was using just my section to try to draw a conclusion about all MSIT 3000 students. Um, and that's questionable, right? I guess I shouldn't say our since y'all weren't there. That section may not be representative of all MSIT 3000 students. And this is a problem, right? If we're trying to generalize to all MSIT 3000 students, we need a representative sample. Um, and I actually have my doubts about this one because I had kind of an unusual group last year. I had a lot of transfer students, um, way more juniors than sophomores, which usually is not the case in MSIT 3000. And being a different year, that could affect their housing choices. Um, so I think this is actually a bigger concern to me than the sample size, right? Because if you don't have a representative sample, um, then everything else is highly suspect. Okay, but let's just say that there is a difference, right? The MSIT 3000 students really are different from the UGA population. Um, we want to know which categories are different. So we could just use the deviations. We could just do observed minus expected. Um, and that's a good way to start, sort of to see where do you have more than expected and where do you have less. Okay, so if, if we subtract observed minus expected, we can see that we had more students living off campus than we would have expected, so four more than we would have expected. We also have more students um, living in fraternity or sorority housing than we would have expected, um, positive number there too, and we have less students in on-campus housing. You may also notice that these add up to zero. That's the way it's going to work with deviations. Um, and then I'm not going to write it all out, but if we plug into the formula for standardized residuals, um, we can sort of get a better idea of which ones are unusual. So this one um, for off-campus only comes out to be 0.63. So that's not really a very large standardized residual. The fraternity and sorority houses, though, that one comes out to be big. That's 5.17. So if you think about it, this deviation is really big relative to what we expected, right? We thought this was going to be a really small expected count, and then we ended up with, you know, over three times that many. So we end up with a really big standardized residual there. It seems like they were way more likely to live in fraternity or sorority housing than we would have expected. Um, and the on-campus one, this actually ends up being a pretty big standardized residual too negative 3.23. We usually say anything beyond negative 2 and 2 is unusual, um, so this is pretty unusual too. So it seems like maybe it's not so much about um, people living off campus, but instead of living on campus, um, MSIT 3000 students tend to live in fraternity or sorority houses, at least based on um, the data collected from this section.